Good afternoon and welcome to our Cure Alzheimer's Fund presentation. This afternoon, I'm Tim Armour, President and CEO of Cure Alzheimer's Fund. And I'm here today with my colleague, Meg Smith, who's the Senior Vice President for Research Management, and Dr. Rudy Tanzi, who is at Mass General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, and most importantly for us, is the chair of our Cure Alzheimer's Fund research leadership group. We're pleased to welcome you here today. And as I see the numbers of people are still joining us, we thank you for taking your time to be with us today for this update. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. One is that uh, those of you who've been participating in Zoom world over the last few weeks know that there have been some hacks to Zoom conferences, uh, regardless of the topic. If that were to happen today, we would simply end today's Zoom conference and reconvene another day. We think that's a very remote possibility, but if it happens, that's what we'll do. More importantly, we invite your questions. Uh, you'll note that there's a Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your, of your Zoom screen, which you are free to use. And uh, please do jump on there and, and submit your questions. Now, with the number of people we have today, and right now I notice we're up to 76 people who've signed on, uh, it's unlikely that we'll be able to answer all questions. So I thank you in advance for your patience and your understanding if we don't get to your question, but we invite you to submit it. But mostly we're here to welcome you today to this update. So let's look first at our agenda. Here's what we wanna to do today. Our objectives are to uh, bring you up to date on the status of Cure Alzheimer's Fund operations during this pandemic and most importantly, to let you know that the research that you're helping to fund is progressing through these difficult times. And as a reminder, that research is focused on understanding Alzheimer's disease, how it starts, how it progresses in order to accelerate effective therapy development. The research we support leads to breaking old paradigms and creating new ones and always with the goal of slowing, stopping, or even one day reversing Alzheimer's disease. So I'll start with some information about our current operations and Meg Smith will follow up and give us an update on current research that we are uh, uh, currently funding and supporting. And then Dr. Rudy Tanzi will provide some insight on how the research, Alzheimer's research community is faring right now. But let's start with some facts and figures. In 2020, the U.S. government through Medicare and Medicaid will spend about $305 billion, billion with a B, to care for people with this disease. In addition, there's the equivalent of another $250 billion provided by family members and unpaid caregivers. So altogether, we're looking at an annual figure of something on the order of $550 billion to care for Alzheimer's patients. Some more numbers for context. Currently, there are about 6 million diagnosed Alzheimer's patients, but it's estimated that only one in four Alzheimer's patients are diagnosed. So that means there may be as many as 24 million out there in the United States, <clears throat> excuse me, currently with the disease. Approximately one in 10 people, 65 and older, have the disease, and one in three people, 85 and older, are symptomatic. What all these numbers mean, of course, is that it's hard to find a family in the United States today that hasn't been touched by Alzheimer's disease. And this is a fact known to everybody here on the round table today. That's in fact why we are here today. All of us committed to the accomplishing the message, the mission of Cure Alzheimer's Fund, which is to end the disease through continued innovative research. But specifically, what are some of the things that we're doing? During this pandemic, like every other business designated as non-essential, we're working from home and doing the best we can to maintain the momentum, tremendous momentum that was established in the beginning of the year for both contributions and our research distributions. Uh, because our board so generously supports all of our operations, we are fully staffed and the funding of the research continues, which Meg will describe in a, in a few minutes. And despite the current economic circumstances, contributions for 2020 
at least as of mid-March, were ahead as compared to the same time last year. We're so grateful to our supporters who continue to prioritize Alzheimer's disease research in their giving. We also want to continue our communications and outreach to our donors while being sensitive to their situations and priorities during this time. Uh, our annual report for 2019 will be distributed in June. We'll be sending out our e-newsletters by uh, email in the not too distant future and our regular research uh, newsletter, which is printed and mailed, will be available also uh, later this spring. And our website continues to be frequently updated with the research that we're pursuing. You know, every day we are honored, moved, and humbled by our donor families, many of whom are going above and beyond in this time, not only to take care of their own loved ones, but to reach out to others, many doing that by contributions to Cure Alzheimer's Fund. For example, we recently learned about one of our uh, longtime donors, an elderly gentleman taking care of his wife at home with good professional caregiving, but those professional caregivers had to go home and take care of their own family. So this elderly man is taking care of his Alzheimer's wife alone uh, without access to other help, can't go out. But even with that, he has continued to contribute to Cure Alzheimer's Fund. Similarly, <clears throat> pardon me, another one of our longtime donors, a wonderful woman whose mother is in a great uh, assisted living facility, reports that even though she's getting great care there, she's terrified because the staff is wearing masks and that exacerbates all of the symptoms for her Alzheimer's. But despite this, these increased hardships, the Alzheimer's community continues to be very generous, donating uh, in honor of people who have Alzheimer's, the number of people who are passing away from Alzheimer's, uh, with COVID um, uh, uh, affects has unfortunately very uh, rapidly increased. And so we're seeing a lot of those memorial gifts, all of them which help close the gap between what we need, uh, what we have and what we need to find a cure for this disease. In the face of that uncertainty, in the face of coronavirus, all of you here who have joined us, <coughs> pardon me today, continue to be the heroes that sustain the momentum to support the researchers who continue to work tirelessly and many, many at some risk to end this disease. And for a look at how we're currently supporting those people right now, I'll turn this over to my colleague, Meg Smith. Thank you, Tim, and thank you so much for joining us today. We are grateful for your support and your attention during this difficult time. And I very much appreciate the opportunity to tell you about the important work your support enables. 2020 started out a strong year for research at Cure Alzheimer's Fund, and we are determined that it will continue to be. We had great funding activity, over three and a half million dollars through March, a wonderfully productive in-person meeting of our research leadership group in San Diego in February, and exciting discoveries coming out of the labs and projects that we support. Since news of the coronavirus emerged early in 2020, we at Cure Alls and our research partners across the United States and the world have followed the developments, attempted to anticipate the impacts to our field, and plan for various scenarios. Cure Alls funds research across innumerable time zones, so our funded labs in different geographies have experienced very different levels of reduced lab work and different prognoses for reopening, but all have been affected. Some of our researchers have been called upon as clinicians and scientists to be part of the fight against COVID-19, and we are incredibly proud of their efforts. Danny Laskowitz, for example, who normally leads a neurology ICU at Duke University, is now leading an ICU dedicated to COVID-19 and victims suffering neurological issues from that disease. While Bob Data at Harvard is investigating how the virus triggers the loss of smell and whether understanding that could teach us a new way to fight or diagnose it. We just heard this week from Cheryl Wellington at UBC in Canada about how she and her collaborators at UBC have transformed a planned study of hypoxic ischemic brain injury into a study of neurological consequences of COVID-19 and different treatment approaches that has now enrolled more than 80% of all eligible patients in British Columbia. The data from that study will be disseminated across the world as other areas also face these consequences. Other labs have members who are currently on leave to be frontline clinicians, 
and have donated materials, including personal protection equipment, technical expertise, and access to key tools. We are proud of each and every one of them. But COVID-19 has not changed our focus on research towards preventing, slowing, and reversing the consequences of Alzheimer's disease. And while we are all working from home at Cure Alzheimer's Fund, we are still working very hard on your behalf as the people who make the research possible. If anything, COVID-19 has heightened awareness of the need to understand key questions also raised by Alzheimer's disease. For example, how the blood-brain barrier changes with age and may allow increased access to the brain by viruses and other pathogens, and how the innate immune system and its neuroinflammation toolkit can be modulated to protect the brain without also turning on the brain. We have just renewed our support for our Fleming APOE Consortium, which brings together six labs to attack a wide range of questions regarding how and why APOE4 is the biggest genetic driver of risk for late onset Alzheimer's. The APOE protein has multiple functions both in and out of the brain, and the collaborative efforts of the extraordinary labs involved is ensuring that its roles are being investigated in concert rather than in isolation. Their kickoff call yesterday really brought home to me how diverse yet interconnected their activities will be and how thoughtfully they are collaborating. As part of this renewal, Curals has also initiated development of a mouse model that will carry the recently discovered Christchurch mutation, an APOE3 mutation that seems to offset the risk facing individuals carrying a presnilin 1 gene variant that otherwise inevitably leads to early onset Alzheimer's. This is a truly exciting tool we look forward to sharing with the entire field because it will offer insight into how one gene variant can offset the otherwise devastating implications of another. We recently funded a project from Drs. Mobley and Chavez Gutierrez investigating the complex consequences of A beta production and for a project from Drs. Choi and Ran on whether we can reproduce and exaggerate the neurological benefits of exercise pharmacologically. The important research into Alzheimer's pathology, the factors that contribute to its development and exacerbation that our donors make possible is continuing even while wet lab experimentation must slow or pause. Our researchers are not the kind of people who like to sit still, and in fact, none of them are. I am in frequent contact with researchers around the world, and they are all determined to make progress against Alzheimer's, even if they can't be as much in or at all in the lab as they are used to. Some institutions have halted all research not related to COVID-19, but others are finding creative ways to continue research while honoring the need to practice social distancing and protect the health and safety of lab members. For example, labs at Wash U in St. Louis allow only four members on site at a time. So they have put together shifts of people that work late into the night to allow many more shifts a day than are, they normally accommodate. There is a lot of writing going on, spontaneous scientific talks, data analytics, and experimental design across collaborations and within labs. In-person conferences have transitioned to virtual, and talks that might have previously been limited to institutional departments are being opened up to researchers around the country. I recently spoke to a lab in our circuits epigenetics consortium who told me that this has given them the opportunity to catch up on analyzing the many samples obtained and processed during the first period of our funding to that consortium, and that they expect to submit nine papers as a result of this time out of the lab. The circuits and neuroinflammation consortia that we have wanted to bring together for quite some time are finally going to be able to meet in the next month because their schedules out of the lab are accommodating this time together. That meeting will encompass labs across time 10 time zones, and we are really excited to see what new collaborations will arise across these consortia. Time is a precious commodity to our very driven and busy researchers, and COVID-19 has in some ways given them time back. We are adding touch points as Cure Alzheimer's Fund to take advantage of this time. We are also going to be hosting an APOE mini seminar on May 14th that will bring together labs from around the world who are looking at APOE. And it will expose all of these labs to the work of our APOE consortium and make sure that the APOE consortium is aware in turn of projects going on that we fund that are outside the consortium. Accelerating the field's access to findings and thus their ability to act on them is a small silver lining to this shutdown period. However, Cure Alzheimer's funding always comes with accountability. 
and our funded labs are acutely aware of their commitment to us and through us to all of you to pursue and complete the studies that we funded in their labs. We are partnering with the labs to offer additional time to those that need it due to the shutdown so that they can complete the work that we need from them. In turn, we are communicating to labs that we are able to uphold our commitments to them. Thanks to our donors, we are able to say that we will provide the renewal funding we promised to any lab showing good progress and that we will continue to be a first line resource for the best investigators with the best ideas for fighting this disease. We will continue to initiate and fund projects that can make progress now and to prepare them to make immediate progress as soon as the labs reopen. I do want to address one final challenge to Alzheimer's research posed by COVID-19, and that is the disruption to clinical trials. Curals is focused on understanding the mechanisms of the disease to advance a better understanding of treatment opportunities. And we support clinical trials when they arise from scientific projects that we supported when they were still wet lab efforts. Many Alzheimer's clinical trials are struggling due to the need to protect patients from unnecessary COVID-19 exposure and thus must pause their proceedings. The FDA is working with trial sponsors to offer flexibility where possible, but this is a high concern for all of us. I am very happy to report though, that a clinical trial from biotech startup Amelix that Cure Alzheimer's Fund is, fun, is supporting and which is testing a combinatorial therapy to improve mitochondrial function has just this month reached full enrollment and has so far been able to stay completely on schedule. Amlix will also announce the full details of its positive trial of the same therapeutic combination when in an ALS population later this spring. And we are hopeful that its success in the ALS trial bodes well for its efficacy in Alzheimer's disease as well. Finally, I would like to thank again our donors for making all of this work possible. Our researchers are immensely grateful to you and I am speaking on their behalf when I tell you just how important your support is and how vital it is to continued progress. Uh, I am very happy to turn this over now to Dr. Rudy Tanzi, the chair of our research leadership group. I will unmute. <clears throat> well, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Meg. Thank you for, we have 94 participants. That's an amazing number. Um, so grateful for that. Thank you for your support. Thank you for being here. I just looked through the um, <clears throat> participant list on the attendees and saw so many familiar names. I can picture you all sitting out there in a big room uh, watching. So this is, uh, thank goodness for Zoom. Um, I, I look forward later on to the Q&A. Um, I hope you ask me whatever questions you want. It doesn't have to be what I, about what I uh, talk about. Any, any questions you have just in general about Alzheimer's or about new things you read in the press or, or ongoing issues in Alzheimer's uh, research, feel free to uh, submit those uh, questions. So do, do we know, should, do we tell folks how to do that already, Meg? Um, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if people want to post questions there after Rudy uh, is done with his remarks, I will start uh, passing out the questions. So I will um, address the questions to you or to Tim according <clears throat> to the topic. So once you're done, let me know and I will open up the Q&A. Great. And you can, you can um, stop putting those questions in Q&A whenever you want. Um, so I think, you know, at Mass General, I wear a number of different hats. I am vice chair of neurology and I direct the genetics and aging research unit, which is mainly Alzheimer's uh, research. Also co-direct the McCann Center for Brain Health and co-direct the Mass General Institute for Neurodegeneration. But I have to tell you with all um, honesty that I'm most passionate, most proud of the hat I wear at Cure Alzheimer's Fund as head of the research leadership group, because I get to basically co-chair a group of the top, literally without argument, the top Alzheimer's researchers in the world and get to interact with them all the time, collaborate, guide research. Um, couldn't really have a better role than that um, if you wanna fight this disease and end it. Um, now it's been challenging around um, uh, early March, um, <clears throat> I became ill with uh, uh, symptoms that were similar to COVID. I don't. I didn't get tested at the time for live virus. So um, I was uh, ill for um, uh, 
almost till now, um, but I did get tested for live virus last week with a nasal swab and I'm okay. I, I don't have live virus and I'll have an antibody test tomorrow to see if I was affected. And if I was, I will see if I have enough antibodies to help patients uh, with convalescent plasma. But I'm, I'm doing uh, fine now. And I think somehow that travel does catch up with you when you're shaking too many hands and, and seeing too many people right during the uh, uh, troublesome time um, uh, of this uh, epidemic. Now, meanwhile, and I, st I did stay home from the lab and worked from home as soon as I, I, I felt a little ill. And I, and I assure you, I'm fine now. Um, um, and uh, around mid-March, we had to shut the lab down. Now, when I say shut down, you don't completely shut down. We were able to put forward, including myself, 15 uh, members of the, of the unit in the labs as essential, uh, uh, I would call level four personnel. They can go in during the shutdown, just like Meg mentioned what they're doing at WashU. We would have we have shifts. We don't have too many people in the lab at the same time. We're wearing masks. We're being careful. But in this way, we have to make sure the Alzheimer's and the dish plates stay healthy. The cells stay healthy. Somebody has to make sure the mice, you know, mice don't stop being mice. They still do what they do. So you have to go in there and make sure the cages don't get overcrowded, that they get fed, they get taken care of. So all this stuff still goes on, uh, all the maintenance. And some of the experiments we were doing that just couldn't stop, um, we did allow to, you know, we got special permission to keep those going on. So research still happened at a limited level. But what happened outside the lab was quite astonishing, which was that uh, we had so much interaction. I, every single day when I wake up, it's one Zoom to another. Um, uh, about a quarter of them are in my role with neurology for COVID leadership, uh, innovation, I can tell you about that. And most of them are with my with lab members. We're having lab meetings, we're having unit meetings, we're having special thematic meetings, we're, we're sharing data. We're, um, you have to realize that we generate, thanks to you and your support, we generate so much data so often that even now, two months, well, now we're a month and a half past the shutdown, we still haven't gotten through all the data we generated as new data to analyze. Because we're generating data all the time and then by the time you get it together and analyze it, there is a backlog. So one great thing that came out of this is we're analyzing all the data that would normally take much longer to analyze. So I'm still enjoying looking at new data every day and analyzing data and planning next experiments. And um, and some really cool stuff has come out of it. But let me you know, tell you a little bit, before I get to the Alzheimer's stuff, um, and I won't go too long, don't worry, Meg, I know what you're thinking, and I know Tim's thinking, he's gonna go on and on. But uh, let me tell you about um, what's happened with COVID at Mass General. So we knew we needed more ICU space, intensive care unit. So many of the uh, uh, floors and buildings uh, that weren't ICU were turned into ICUs. But they didn't have the computerized, centralized, um, equipment and monitoring to know if someone was getting into trouble. Is someone decompensating who needs a ventilator? Is somebody on a ventilator um, needs to have their settings changed because they're not getting enough oxygen? So what they've done is they've actually redeployed our technicians. The research technicians, um, uh, including our own, were redeployed to monitor. They're called listeners so that they can Pay it, they, they, they're listening to or monitoring the oxygen saturation and the, and the vital statistics of folks who are on ventilators or folks who may have to go on to ventilators. And, and then physically telling a nurse if something's going wrong. So our techs are contributing that way. Other techs are contributing with language skills. Others are just bringing food to the front lines at the ICU. Everybody's pitching in. And Mass General has just been an amazing place for for COVID in terms of the redeployment. Our neurologists, our neurology residents have all been redeployed to taking care of ICU patients. Um, and we have an innovation task force for clinical trials. And I can tell you that much of what we're learning from Cure Alzheimer's Fund, and I'll tell you both in terms of genetics and in terms of drug discovery, we're translating over to COVID because You've probably heard this term cytokine storm, which means that you get a COVID infection and some people show no symptoms at all, or just mild symptoms. But in others, there's this rampant 
immune response to the infection and you have an overly robust amount of inflammation, well, inflammation is driven by these chemicals called cytokines. And if the cytokines go too crazy, then the cytokine storm leads to massive inflammation in the lungs, and then you can't breathe. And that's when you have to go on a ventilator. And if that storm keeps surging, this is how many people uh, are facing, unfortunately, facing death. So remember what I told you about Alzheimer's every talk I give. The plaques and the tangles form first and start to kill neurons. But you don't really get into big trouble until in the brain, there's enough massive neuroinflammation, inflammation again, that's causing the requisite huge number of cell death and neurons that causes dementia. So the analogy is that Alzheimer's disease, although triggered by plaques and tangles, is a cytokine storm in the brain. Okay, it's the same thing. And in COVID, it's the virus that's triggering the cytokine storm. So many of the drugs and natural products that we've learned about in Alzheimer's in a dish to hit inflammation in Alzheimer's, we can now share with the docs at Mass General treating COVID patients and say, give this a try, give this a try. 55 different clinical trials are going on for COVID. And a number of them involve the suggestions from our unit that came from Cure Alzheimer's funded work on neuroinflammation translated to lung inflammation. So, and I can tell you that I got off of a call today uh, with the neurology department um, and our survival rate for, for COVID patients going to the ICU, right now our survival rate at Mass General is 90% which is much higher than the national average. And I think it's just a testament to just good medical care, good research, good, good organization and coordination, including all hands on deck from everywhere. Meanwhile, like I said, the lab keeps going. We have our central personnel still working. Um, in some cases, many cases, we're loaning lab equipment we're not using right now to ICU so they have more testing ability. We're loaning supplies like pipettes and things we have for COVID, everyone's working together. So it's just, um, although this is a terrible time, terrible crisis, I've never seen so much harmony and balance, communication, goodwill, just pure kindness among human beings uh, in my life at the hospital and, and among um, researchers. Um, you know, um, even the ideas we're getting uh, for COVID, um, no one's thinking about intellectual property or patents or how to protect it. You know, they're only thinking, get it out there. I had some ideas about COVID um, that I just tweeted. I put on Twitter and I said, everybody, please retweet so somebody might see it and do it. Um, and now there's a company in Switzerland that's taken on one of the ideas that we put out there to capture these naturally occurring antibodies that can attack the COVID virus and then make them into a drug, similar to how we inspired aducanumab with our early work on naturally occurring amyloid antibodies um, that protect against Alzheimer's. So let me tell you a few things now that, that we've done, um, that a, a few discoveries we've made, even though the labs have been basically unlimited um, activity. Um, one of the, first, let me start with COVID. Um, one of the things we did for COVID was we were able to use tools, genetic analysis tools that Cure Alzheimer's Fund funded to be developed by Christoph Lang, we took those same tools that look at genomic clustering in Alzheimer's patients, we used those, and I say we, it's really Christoph Lang and his group, used those to analyze 10,000, actually 11,000 COVID virus sequences from 11,000 patients from China, Europe, and the US. And what we discovered is, and this is a new discovery and the paper is going to Nature, it will probably be expedited for publication. And for the first time, using a Cure Alzheimer's funded algorithm applied to COVID, we discovered there are four distinct subgroups of this virus. For once, there's a China subgroup. Then there's the China-European hybrid subgroup from when it spread to Italy. Then there's a more European-centric subgroup. And then there's a subgroup in, in the US that's influenced by Europe. So you can actually track geographically 
the travel of this virus from China through Europe to here, and then see the different genetic subgroups that concentrated in each population. And why this is important is because now, as you try to treat this disease, you need to look at each four of these individual subgroups of virus and make sure whatever you're doing is effective at diagnosing and treating um, all of them. So this is gonna be a very big paper that we made possible inadvertently through our algorithms that Cure Alzheimer's funded as part of the Alzheimer's Genome Project. Um, uh, okay, so now on to Alzheimer's disease. We have, we're writing all kinds of new papers because one of the things, as, as Meg mentioned, one thing we can do is not just analyze all the backlog of data, we can actually write up papers that get backlogged. Because you know, every day we're busy, we don't get to, do, to write up our papers fast enough or analyze data. Now we can. That's one of the silver linings of, of being home um, every day and on Zoom calls with people. Um, so um, uh, we're working directly with the group that found that Christchurch APOE mutation that protects. It turns out in, these, uh, in this population of, of presenilla mutant patients in Colombia that we helped find, I mean, helped to define, um, there are other genes that protect them besides APOE and we're helping them to find those and we're getting some new clues. We're also, um, uh, Meg and I had a great talk with one of the neuroinflammation consortium members, uh, Bob Data, and we were able to figure out something really new about one of the newest Alzheimer's genes that causes neuroinflammation. It's called MS4A. And that led to a whole new collaboration um, that can begin just with, you know, analysis that we're doing with Bob now. Um, with another group who's funded by Cure Alzheimer's Fund, Philip Swirsky, we found that a certain cytokine called IL-3 is protective and it's a protective effect, and, and we're actually sending a paper off to, to nature um, on a whole new finding of this cytokine called interleukin-3 and how it affects um, Alzheimer's disease brain and developing therapies based on that. This is all since the shutdown. Um, we also have found that, so I should tell you that the first, technically the first study Cure Alzheimer's ever funded was a study in my wife's lab, Dora Kovacs' lab, way back 15 years ago, on a class of drug called ACAT inhibitors, ACAT inhibitors, ACAT1 inhibitors. And they were being developed to turn down the production of amyloid beta protein, like we were all doing mostly 15 years ago. And now we have a paper going out to Cell, a very big journal, where we found in our lab that the a beta, so the amyloid beta that's most toxic, as you might imagine, is the stuff that's made at the synapse because the amyloid beta comes back and attacks the synapses where the nerve cells make connections. And it attacks the axons that connect nerve cells. And what we found is that, and this has been a big mystery in the field, where does the amyloid beta from synapses come from? How does it get made? And what we found without getting into any detail is that it's made through a very specialized process directly where the synapses are. And if you inhibit ACAT, you block the synaptic A beta. So here we, go, here we would go back to the first project Cure Alzheimer's funded, and now we're gonna put new emphasis on this drug class that will hit the most toxic form of amyloid beta, which accumulates at the synapse of neurons. And that we all, that, this is something we realized and put together with data analysis since the COVID uh, crisis began. Um, this, this then gets into our uh, 3D Alzheimer's in a dish, our 80 Alzheimer's in a dish models, these mini uh, brain organoids we grow in a dish where we can do drug discovery. I can tell you that we've made many new versions of it that, that are uh, becoming more and more sophisticated every day. Of course, we can't work on those systems right now, but we can analyze a ton of data. And what I mean is that we already screened in that system for drugs that stop tangles and plaques and neuroinflammation. And many of the drugs and natural products, everything from um, approved drugs to mushroom extracts um, to Chinese medicines, like something, you know, I can't even pronounce this, it's Wo Lo Xiao Ling, HLXL. We're sending a paper to Nature Neuroscience on Wo Lo Xiao Ling, HLXL, Chinese medicine because of its incredible effects on neuroinflammation. And then we told the COVID people that they should look at it too, and they're looking at it. Everybody's working together. So with the hits we got out of the 3D Alzheimer's in a dish, we did, um, what we can do is we got 38 different drugs that worked, about two dozen natural products, and, and you can then put those into computer programs and algorithms 
to say if these drugs work and these natural products work, based on everything we know about those in the entire internet databases, what can you predict, dear computer, about other drugs that might work? And we have a whole list of other drugs just waiting to go into the dish that are coming out of what we call in silico, silicon, in silico analyses. And many of these drugs are very exciting. Um, and, and, and there are many drugs that are safe that we think we can get into working. Interesting, one of the main drugs being tried for COVID right now for inflammation is called ivermectin. And that was one of our top hits for hitting neuroinflammation. So there's this really amazing overlap between what hits the cytokine storm in the brain that causes neuroinflammation and Alzheimer's and the cytokine storm in the lung triggered by the infection uh, of COVID. Um, so I'm happy to answer more question, you know, questions about, about that. We've also, just want to end by saying we've also done a lot of more work on Rob Moyer. As you know, Rob Moyer tragically passed away in December um, at, uh, at, at 58 years old and with a glioblastoma. But Rob's work goes on big time. Uh, I took over his lab. His lab is, is fully funded. They're going strong. Um, we are looking at you know, more into the, uh, what's called the antimicrobial protection hypothesis, how amyloid beta isn't just junk, as Rob first showed. It's protective in the brain against microbes and viruses. This is also important for COVID because COVID gets into the brain through the nose. And so this is a, going to be something we have to do is, and we, we're doing this now at the McCann Center, is we're going to be tracking for folks who have had COVID exposure by antibody tests or by nasal swab PCR test, over time we'll track what's happening in their brain. Because if the COVID, not everyone's going to get COVID in their brain if they had COVID, but some might have. And then we have to ask, is that going to trigger amyloid plaques and tangles? Is it going to spread from one brain region to the other? And some of you may have remembered in my talks that Alzheimer's begins, if you go up the nose and back, you get the olfactory bulb in the brain, then you got the enteronal cortex, and that's what connects to the short-term memory area hippocampus. That's where the pathology spreads. That's where this virus spreads. So we have to keep close track on what this virus might do in the brain for triggering Alzheimer's pathology. And that's something we're also going to do. Uh, this would be also part of the innate immune system. Um, I gave a talk in Rob's honor at the ADPD meeting, a big uh, meeting, ADPD, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, it was a virtual meeting online because they couldn't hold it in Vienna like we wanted to go. Meg was supposed to go too. Um, but I did give my talk and it should be publicly available. It was in honor of Rob's work. And I received a huge amount of, of, of uh, great feedback on that talk on the innate immune hypothesis of Alzheimer's, how Alzheimer's pathology, as I talked about at the uh, last summit dinner uh, that many of you were at, that all of Alzheimer's pathology, plaques, tangles, and neuroinflammation could be looked at as having evolved as one orchestrated innate immune response in the brain. And now we pay for it with the genetics that evolved with that along the way. So um, I think what I'll do is I'll stop there. That's the uh, uh, overall um, summary. But look, anything you're thinking about um, on Alzheimer's or read about, anything you want to ask, feel free. Oh, one thing I didn't mention, one, one quick thing. There's never, I never really end. Uh, we're doing, we did a lot of work on deep brain stimulation. You've all heard about deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease. We're learning a lot about deep brain stimulation for Alzheimer's, and we're actually figuring out ways to lower amyloid through deep brain stimulation that's quite effective in the mice. Now, deep brain stimulation is invasive. So what we've done, this is the work of Sean Patel in the lab, this is relatively new work, is we take what deep brain stimulation is doing in the brain and then mimic that with an external um, transducer. So this is like a helmet you put on the mice and it, and, it, and it delivers the same electromagnetic frequencies that deep brain stimulation would, but through the skull. And we're getting really great results, at least in the mice so far, in mimicking the effects of deep brain stimulation with an external transcranial direct current stimulation helmet. And that's something we're also going to push forward. Really cool results there as well. So now I'll stop and I'll let Meg, I guess you're going to moderate the questions, right? Yes. Thank you so much, Rudy. That was obviously fantastic. Uh, we do have some questions. I'm, I'm going to mention to everyone that your questions will be visible to everyone who's attending who looks at the Q&A. 
So please do be sensitive about uh, any kind of personal information you, you put in there. Um, but the first question we have is about the status of Biogen's drug, aducanumab. I'm sure many people saw in the news this week that Biogen is delaying its filing until the third quarter. Can you talk about uh, what that means and, and what the status is with the FDA? Well, you know, stat, it's what you just said. I mean, we, you know, the FDA will look at this. It's, it's, you know, I don't know what the Las Vegas odds are for, uh, for approval. I mean, I do want to remind people that the um, aducanumab began with Rob Moyer, the late Rob Moyer. Rob Moyer was the one who, when he was a postdoc in my lab, we published a paper that showed naturally occurring antibodies that protect you against Alzheimer's. And these antibodies recognized a certain form of amyloid beta that was released from the brain into the blood. And it was, uh, uh, that's what inspired Roger Nietzsche at a small company in Switzerland called Neuroimmune to find those actual antibodies we described and then reverse translate them into a drug which Biogen licensed and that became aducanumab. So we have a nice connection to it. And I should tell you that before Rob passed away, Roger went out of his way to um, let Rob know directly that if Aducanian Bob works, um, is approved and it does help people and it works, that he will forever honor Rob as the first, as the person who inspired that discovery. And um, Rob knew that, you know, uh, a couple of you know, weeks before he passed away. So um, aducanumab, you know, um, it, there's lots of question marks. I mean, I think the FDA is going to think not only about the data, right? We had one phase three trial that showed if you lowered amyloid, you helped cognition somewhat. Another equally sized phase three, phase three trial was negative. Biogen stated reasons why one may have been negative or positive and, you know, gave it their best shot. But the FDA is also going to look at if this is approved, it's a $10,000 a month treatment. And you have to have a PET scan that's $5,000 to know if you should get it. And then you have to have MRIs while you're getting it to make sure you're not getting uh, any side effects of hemorrhage or edema. So when you add it all up for a patient, this one patient, this is gonna cost as much up, up to $150,000 for one patient for one year. Then the question is gonna become who gets it, you know? And um, the healthcare system can't afford that. So you gotta, we gotta think about the, the whole story. And this is why we're so lucky that Cure Alzheimer's Fund saw benefit in what Steve Wagner and I were doing with gamma sequitase modulators because gamma sequitase modulators are little white pills that are cheap. Um, and you take, the, you take the pill and it basically brings amyloid down as well without having to have um, you know, uh, uh, a $10,000 recombinant humanized antibody. So I'm hoping that aducanumab will open the door, right? Even if it's not gonna become the drug we use because it's too expensive, it's too kludgy, then it will open the door so that once the FDA says, yeah, we're comfortable with this, hitting amyloid is a good thing to do if you do it early enough and we can help people. Preferably, we like to do it pre-symptomatically. Now think about how many people pre-symptomatically right now, and not all of them are gonna get Alzheimer's, but pre-symptomatically have amyloid beta in their brain at levels you can detect, 38 million. 38 million Americans already have detectable amyloid in their brain. Who's not going to want the drug? It's like having high cholesterol. And they say, no, you can't get statin. You can't get a statin, it's too expensive. So this is going to be very interesting how it all pans out. That's why to have a little white pill that's cheap that you can take to achieve the same goal, like the way you take your Lipitor, that's the end game. That's the long game. And Cure Alzheimer's Fund has been right behind us the whole way to make sure our gamma sequitase modulators get out there as their alternative after hopefully aducanumab opens the door, or what, even if it doesn't open the door. And we'll be going into our phase one trial. Um, the hope is to get the phase one trial going um, as soon as the FDA approves our, our package for safety. And that whole safety package is being assembled and presented to the FDA over the coming months. 
So uh, Rudy, to your point, Biogen could actually apply to the FDA in the third quarter and get approved but it could be the case then that CMS and the other decision makers for Medicare do not approve um, reimbursement because uh, the cost benefit is considered not to be favorable. Um, we won't know what that looks like or, or how they will make that decision until we get to that point or if we get to that point. Um, but it is clear that Biden is being very thoughtful about this already. They have reached out to um, thought leaders across Alzheimer's disease and across um, gerontology practices uh, to try to discuss how the capacity in the healthcare system could be expanded for an infusion therapy. So um, many people are discussing whether or not home infusion should be covered by Medicare for all kinds of indications. And Biogen is very much a part of that conversation because they are hoping that home infusion might be an option for aducanumab. Right now, there are simply not enough infusion seats, literally chairs in infusion centers for the number of Alzheimer's patients who might someday be eligible for aducanumab. So as Rudy's pointing out, the question is very complicated and it goes far beyond what is a relatively small effect size seen in the favorable phase three clinical trial for aducanumab and gets into much more complex questions around what our healthcare system can actually accommodate. Yeah, that's um, a great point. Hey, let me just also say that, that um, you know, it, aducanumab itself, I mean, I, you know, I, many people think, I mean, if you ask, we asked researchers at a meeting recently, whether they wanted to see aducanumab approved or not. And it was really split down the middle. And the ones who don't want to see it approved, even if they like amyloid as a target, are afraid that of, about the chaos it will create about who's going to get it and how many people are going to get it. And, but for those who really believe that the future, like, you know, the future of treating this disease is going to be early, just like we've always said at Cure Alzheimer's Fund, our first mantra, first day we started, early prediction, early detection, early intervention. And, you know, hitting amyloid is going to be the earliest thing we can do for, for future patients. Right now, um, you have to treat neuroinflammation. Um, and, but I think for, early, for this early detection, early prevention strategy, hitting amyloid is important. And, I, and so half of us like me are hoping that you can will open that door. It will just soften, you know, just, just grease the skid so that we can get cheaper, safer, drugs into the amyloid space, like gamma secretase modulators, or even, or even chromalin. Chromalin's a drug that came out of our Cure, Cure Alzheimer's Fund, Alzheimer's in a Dish model. It's in a phase three trial at AZ Therapies, we'll read out later this year. It not only stops neuroinflammation, but it converts those microglial cells into amyloid eating cells again. So the same cells that were killing neurons with neuroinflammation are turned back into amyloid clearing cells. So chromalin is a very cheap drug that could be used for that. We'll, we'll learn about that trial uh, later this year. And I think that trial has a good chance because the Amelix trial, which you know, um, some of you may know Amelix started literally in my office with two kids from Brown who were undergrads when they came to see me and um, had this idea and I fostered the idea with them and, and they did their first trial in ALS. And like Meg said, that trial succeeded. Uh, there's gonna be a paper it will come out in New England Journal of Medicine, hopefully soon. They will describe a successful trial and the, and the company's talking to the FDA about approval of the first two drugs that protect neurons against neuroinflammation at both the level of the mitochondria and where proteins are processed into what's called the endoplasmic reticulum. And the fact that that drug worked in ALS, which is a really tough target, uh, by simply giving a bulletproof vest to the neurons against the sniper fire of the microglia, the neuroinflammation, says that neuroinflammation is the best target. And I remind you that Cure Alzheimer's Fund funded the first study that found the first neuroinflammation gene that was in my lab in 2008, CD33. That got this whole ball rolling. The whole neuroinflammation uh, section, sector of Alzheimer's, which is now the most um, uh, uh, studied part of Alzheimer's is neuroinflammation started with Cure Alzheimer's Fund, funding the Alzheimer's Genome Project, leading to the first neuroinflammatory gene that we found, CD33. So um, 
you know, it's amazing how many, how many huge parts of Alzheimer's research Cure Alzheimer's Fund was in front of literally years before. Um, so that actually is a great segue into another question about whether COVID-19 is likely to increase the number of future Alzheimer's patients due to inflammation now or other injury to the brain. Yeah. Um, this reminds me of a conversation that you and I recently had over email with Tuck Finch talking about this very topic and um, the connection between air pollution and COVID-19 and Alzheimer's disease. Can you comment? Yeah. Um, well, like you know, I was saying early on, COVID-19 gets into the brain and it could trigger tangles in amyloid and inflammation. And if you look back at the, the Spanish flu in the early 20th century, there are papers that clear, show a clear correlation between the, ex, the exposure to Spanish flu and then a huge increase in cases of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's in that population later. So many people have pointed to the Spanish flu as having been a contributing risk factor for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's later on. Many papers have been written on that. So I think time will tell how COVID will affect risk for Alzheimer's. But my guess is that we won't see those effects for decades. I don't think COVID's going to cause enough neuroinflammation in the brain to cause Alzheimer's disease. It will cause plaques and tangles, but then it's going to take decades for those plaques and tangles to spread with neuroinflammation before you get the disease. Just like um, <clears throat> chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE, right? The banks that are ahead and football players and boxers come in their teens and 20s. It takes decades for that pathology to spread and propagate so that you get dementia in your, in your 50s or 60s, sometimes in your 40s. So think about COVID, if it gets into the brain, like, a, like banks to the head, it's still going to take decades for it to propagate before I think you're going to see any potential effect on Alzheimer's risk. I don't think there'll be an immediate acute neuroinflammatory driven Alzheimer's from COVID. Um, uh, uh, if, if you would have already seen delirium from that, and we're seeing not really much delirium. Uh, you, do, you do see the loss of taste and smell, but that's reversible. So good question. We'll see. Okay. And how about a connection between COVID-19 <laughs> and air pollution and Alzheimer's disease? Well, there, there was a study that showed, you know, there's a greater spread of COVID in areas where there's more air pollution and, and in areas that are more polluted, but correlation doesn't equal causation, right? So you could argue, well, with air pollution, your lungs are in less, are in, not in good shape and you're more susceptible to the cytokine storm. Or it could just be that in areas where there's a lot of pollution, that these are areas where maybe people are clustering more, they're more crowded, they may not have a healthier, as healthier lifestyle. So it's really tough to tell. I, we do, you know, in, 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 in the blogs I write regarding my books I write, you know, we do tell people, since this is an inflammatory disease, COVID, and everybody after 40 or so has some level of chronic, low-grade inflammation in their body, um, we, we do talk about what can you do every day with lifestyle to reduce your baseline inflammation, getting enough sleep, what we always talk about, diet, microbiome, probiotics, prebiotics, plant-based diets, fiber, seeds, um, exercise, um, you know, meditating, handling stress, or, or you know, being, being peaceful, prayer, whatever works. Um, these are really important right now because you want to do everything you can while you're facing the risk of a COVID infection to keep your baseline inflammation down. So shield, sleep, handle stress. In case of interaction with others, I remind people that social distancing is not the correct term. It's physical distancing. We're not socially distancing right now. We're socially interacting. And so uh, it's physical distancing. But social interaction is probably even greater now for people who are having all kinds of Zoom sessions with their friends from college, like I had last week, right? Um, exercise. Staying intellectually stimulated, learn new things, keep learning new things, learn a new hobby at this time. And of course I said diet. And along with diet, stay hydrated. It's very important to stay hydrated, have a lot of water. So I meant to say that before. So I'm glad I could say it now that prep yourself to keep your baseline inflammation down during this time 
just in case you do get exposed. Um, Rudy, we had a follow-on question uh, regarding CTE, uh, and it's from somebody who's wondering whether a more acute head injury can trigger Alzheimer's in an older person. So somebody mm -hmm. falls, um, which could of course be an indication that, that there's something developing anyway, but somebody falls, hits their head, develops Alzheimer's symptoms. Is that the fall or the, the acute injury that is likely to have triggered the Alzheimer's? So it's complicated, uh, you, you know, over your life, if you had three se very severe concussions, that might equal 20, you know, relatively small concussions, right? So it is the cumulative amount of, of injury that you, that you have in your brain that's leading to tangles and inflammation. CTE, it's tangles and inflammation. So remember, if Alzheimer's is an amyloid-induced tangle disease that leads to inflammation, CTE is a headbang-induced tangle disease. No need for amyloid leading to inflammation and finding enough normal cell death for dementia. So you can imagine having a big enough headbang to lead to enough tangles that quickly spread with neuroinflammation to then get to, to dementia without having to go through amyloid. But if you already are on your way to Alzheimer's with amyloid and tangles, you can imagine how a big headbang would drive even more tangles leading to inflammation, accelerating the route to Alzheimer's. So my own grandmother, um, you know, she was, you know, starting to go downhill uh, cognitively um, in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, but then she fell down the stairs and had, had a very bad uh, traumatic uh, head injury. And after that, she just went straight downhill and she you know, died maybe a year and a half later with, with full-blown severe Alzheimer's disease. So I think there is a reason, I think there is a way for a severe head bang to then accelerate the disease, even though it's mainly through tangles and inflammation, not through amyloid. Um, okay, thank you, Rudy. I think we've got uh, one more question, um, or time for one more question, and then I'll ask Tim to close us out. You know, if if um, you want to keep going, I'll answer more questions. It's up to you. Okay, well, we have, do you want to be sensitive to time, but uh, that's great. Um, do you believe that COVID-19 is different or the same in the U.S. versus other places? And this may be getting to the question of why has our outbreak been so severe um, compared to some other countries. Are we talking, well, that, that, maybe that person could quickly put in do you, severe in terms of numbers of cases or numbers of deaths? I think they're wondering whether our symptoms are different than in other places. You know, this is why, like I was saying, this, this, this discovery of these four different subgroups, genetic subgroups that were made possible with the cure Alzheimer's algorithm, I, we don't know. I mean, I mean, certainly the U.S. is right up there in terms of numbers of cases and numbers of deaths. Um, I, I don't know if it's because we just didn't distance enough. Um, I, we just don't know yet. I, I don't know if the U.S. is special, but I do. We do. At least we do know now, and you're hearing it here first, that there are different subgroups for of U.S. mainly U.S.-Europe hybrid. Europe, China, hybrid, China, and how those different subgroups uh, lead to severity. We, that's something for that has to now be investigated. So when you're saying subgroups, are you referring to mutated versions of the virus? Or are you genetic referring subgroups. Genetic, genetic subgroups? Genetic subgroups, not yeah. clinical subgroups. Oh, we yeah. don't know about clinical subgroups this, yet. This virus is not prone to a lot of genetic mutation. It's not like the cold virus or even influenza, um, which gives us hope that a vaccine will work for a long time once we have one. But there is enough genetic mutation that we have to look at how this affects the viral infectivity and uh, severity. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm frankly surprised at the number of deaths in this country. Um, you know, the number of cases we don't know. I mean, testing is so pathetic in this country. We have no idea how many cases there are. There's, I'm guessing based on the antibody surveys that there are at least 50 times more cases than we think could be a hundred times more cases. All I look at is how many people are dying. And, you know, and whether some people want to argue, well, the final mortality rate is going to be under 1% or 0.5% or 0.1%. It doesn't matter. It's how many people are dying. And we've had a lot of people die in this country. 
and it is very concerning, and I don't think we know why. Um, well, with that note, I will thank you, Rudy, very much, and ask Tim if you have any final words. Well, thank you, Meg and Rudy. Always uh, absolutely terrific. And to all of you out there, my gosh, uh, there were over 95 people joining us. As Rudy said at the beginning, when we look at the list and we look at the names and we can see the faces, uh, most of you are people who've been with us for a long, long time, and we really appreciate it. These are, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, difficult times for researchers, for families, for everyone. And for those of you who have continued to support us through these times, we are deeply, deeply appreciative. The researchers are, and uh, we'll keep going. So we'll, be, we'll do this again. We'll have another one of these uh, sessions in the next uh, month or so and let you know. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you again and look forward to, by then, things being a little bit better in everybody's life. But until then, thank you very much for being here. Take care, stay safe, and we appreciate your help. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.